Good morning, everyone. If you could just find your seats, that would be great, and we'll bring the family in in a moment.
Great, thank you. Please have a seat. And thank you so much for, for coming as we remember and as we celebrate the life of Joanne Weersma. My name is Joel. Uh, I'm the pastor here at the church in Mount Hope. It's good to be with you. Um, so we're here together, yeah? And uh, as we come together, we hope to, to share in some of the weight, right, together. And we uh, share in the memories as, as well. And we do all of this, uh, all of this remembering, all of this celebrating, all of this uh, grieving, all of this wrestling with our emotions. We do all of this before God. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Let's pray. Compassionate God. We pray that you would give us a sense of your presence among us today as we come to terms with the uh, emotions and memories that are all stirred up inside of us. We pray that you, compassionate God, would grant us your peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We, uh, as a church, not as a little church, as a church around the world, have just celebrated Easter, he is risen. So a little snippet from 1 Corinthians. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. But let me tell you something wonderful, a mystery I'll probably never understand. We're not all going to die, but we are all going to be changed on signal from that trumpet from heaven. The dead will be up and out of their graves beyond the reach of death, never to die again. At the same moment, and in the same way, we'll all be changed. In the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen. Everything perishable taken off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable. This mortal replaced by the immortal. And then the saying will come true. Death swallowed by triumphant life. Who got the last word, O oh death? O oh, death, who's afraid of you now? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's, uh, let's, let's sing and, 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 uh, together. So I'll invite you to stand if you're able, and I'll invite our uh, music leaders up.
Thanks, guys. The, the message of, yeah, please have a seat. The, uh, the message of Easter gives this context, right, in which we do uh, all of what we're doing uh, today. And part of what we're doing is, is remembering. Uh, so let me invite up those who are giving some remembrances. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Zainab Graves. I'm Florence's daughter, um, Oma's fourth eldest grandchild, I think, if my math is correct, out of 11. Just a few thoughts. Oma, a lover of flowers, birds, crafts, games, camping, singing, a hot cup of coffee, and good company. I don't remember a time when Oma didn't have flowers in her home. A Christmas cactus, orchids, an amaryllis, or a vase full of fresh cut flowers. Wherever Oma was, flowers were nearby. Also nearby was a craft for the kids. My earliest memories with Oma of us doing some sort of craft. Thistle dolls, weaving a jute seat on a wooden chair frame that Opa made. Corking, always a craft to pass bits of wisdom onto her grandchildren, keep us entertained. And an entertainer at heart, Oma lived for gathering of loved ones. Whether at her house, a fellowship hall, Aunt Alice and Uncle Joe's, or Auntie Moe's and Uncle Harold's. If people gathered together, especially in celebration of Oma, her heart would be warmed for days and it would be a topic of conversation until our next gathering. Sometimes we gathered with just coffee and something sweet and maybe a game of skip bow. Other times we'd gather with a spread fit for a royal family. Bean salad, beer potatoes, Minnie's creamed onions, crunt of sex in a pan, Oma's words, not mine. <laughs> to everyone who opened up their houses and halls to accom accommodate our ever-growing family, thank you. I know it meant the world to Oma, and it's a tradition I look forward to continuing. I think Oma would be really impressed with this gathering here today. So thank you for all being with us to celebrate her life. Hi, I'm, I'm Jennifer. I'm uh, Joel's uh, third daughter. Um, a fun fact, I am actually the 100th descendant from my great Oma Lee, so that was my Oma's mom. Right? Um, so we had a tree planted in, in honor of that on our farm, and uh, it got hit by the lawnmower, so it's been replaced a few times, but there is still a tree there today. So, <laughs> Oma. My Oma was a feisty and committed uh, and very strong woman. She loved her family and she adored her grandchildren. We grandchildren have many memories of our grandparents. They were very active and they loved to be part of our lives. At family events, we would explore through their house. We loved going through Oma's craft room. In their Burlington house, the highlight was a laundry <coughs> chute. All of us cousins would be sent to the basement to play and we'd climb up onto the pile of laundry to climb through the laundry chute and into the bathroom vanity above. 
Once we'd managed to all pull and squeeze each other up, we'd march out triumphantly out through the bathroom where all the adults were. We did lots of Christmas crafts with Oma every year, lots of cards and puzzles, and um, make your own meals in tiny little frying pans. Sometimes we'd sleep over at their house or at their trailer at Elam Lodge. I'll never forget brushing my teeth while staring at those false teeth in a cup of liquid next to the bathroom sink. Later, I'd be tucked into my bed on the floor beside their very high bed. Um, every time we saw our grandparents, my Oma would stroke my hair and exclaim, oh, how beautiful your hair is, Jennifer. Then she would ask if we could trade. Such an awkward question, really. At Christmas, Oma would often make her gifts. One year it was flannel PJs, another time it was four screen sweatshirts with flowers or ducks appliqued on the front, and another year were the vests. Uh, being one of those youngest and closest to them in location, my, my present was never quite finished. I would open my gifts to pieces of fabric cut out and say, oh wow, thanks Oma. <laughs> there was one year that Oma wrapped all the chocolate letters thinking that she would put the names on after she finished the wrapping. And then later on that, the, the later the night went on, the funnier it became as we tried to figure out whose letter we had because of course there's never a Z for Zena. <laughs> my Oma loved it when I would go and sit on Opa's lap. I remember trying to avoid her and pretending not to hear, oh Jen, go sit with your Opa, he just really loves that. And then while all my cousins went off to play, there I was stuck sitting on his lap, waiting for him to, for to just shift a little bit so I could try to sneak off and go play. In the summer, our grandparents uh, would take us biking to Niagara on the lake for a day. Um, my Oma would ride on her bike and lead the way and she had the big curved handlebars and a very cushy padded seat. That seat was the biggest and cushiest seat. She had like a pillow wrapped in towels and they were rubber banded onto her seat. She would lead and Opa would take up the rear, coaxing and encouraging me the whole way. They would boast about how proud they were of me, how cute my chubby little legs were all beet red. I bet they were red. I was on a little pink one speed bike and we went 40 kilometers. <laughs> but then we would pile our bikes into the back of the blue minivan and they would take us out to Swish LA. Oma loved simple things. She found a lot of joy in birds, birds and ducks. She would tell us about all the birds that had visited that, her feeder that morning and always brought bread to feed the ducks. But they did not love the starlings. We would set out back outside in their backyard under that covered awning and Opa would have a coffee in one hand and a broom in the other to chase those starlings away. They had a beautiful backyard. It was starlings, right? Okay. Yeah. They had a beautiful backyard in their house in Burlington with a fish pond and raised garden beds and a pebble stone walkway leading them through the perennial gardens. Oma would point out the plants and tell us the names of all her flowers. Sorry, this is a little long, but we're, we're getting through it. Later in life, when I was dating Mark, they invited us over for dinner. After dinner, we went downstairs for a game of shuffleboard. If any of you ever played shuffleboard with my Oma, you know what came next. When we left, Mark exclaimed, I thought at one point she might start whipping those pucks at us. <laughs> when I married, Oma helped me make boxes out of old greeting cards for our favors. Uh, we sat in the dining room table with the clear plastic tablecloth, sipping herbal tea and folding while Opa was downstairs cutting all those boxes in his workshop. When I would visit them at their house on 20 Place, she would show me all her plants in her living room window, her one orchid and how many blooms it was up to that day. She truly did have pretty unbelievable orchids, like, I think I remember 62 blooms on one plant. I would sit in her glider helping Opa with that day's Sudoku, which she made him do every day to keep his mind young, she said. <laughs> I remember that day that I told Oma I was going to have twins. Twins? Nah. Shh. Yeah, she would say. When my girls were newborns, she would say, there's nothing more beautiful than a baby lying on a blanket under a tree looking up at the rustling leaves. Oma's pantry was full of labeled yogurt containers. One contained dried lentils, one with soybeans, and one hidden in the back corner with peppermints. She reused and recycled before it was a thing. She would tell me about her latest recipe and how you just soak the soybeans and add the garlics and oh yeah, and it's so good for you. <laughs> Oma had some signature dishes, like Zainab mentioned, uh, her roast beef with nutmeg and allspice, beer potatoes, and of course, sex in a pan, which she called fun in a pan. My Oma was gluten-free, and she would get so dis disappointed when we didn't remember to bring a gluten-free dessert, um, but then would conveniently be okay with having some gluten for dessert that night. <laughs> <laughs> On occasion, I would ask her for her recipes. Finally, the deemed they deemed the time was right to pass on Opa's raisin bread. 
recipe. Opa pulled out the recipe card and was going through it in detail. The dried milk, making a well in the flour for the egg. And when he got to the end, he said, and make sure you put a whole cup of craisins in it. And Oma nearby argued, no, Bill, just a half cup. And then she left the kitchen and Oma whispers to me, it has to be a whole cup of, of craisins. And then Oma from the other room, I heard that. I just said half a cup, just half a cup. This went on for some time, so we gathered our coats and we were getting to, ready to leave. As we we're walking out the door, Oma was still convincing me to just set just a half a cup of craisins, Jen. <laughs> As Oma and Opa got older, they got a little quirkier, of course. Oma would forget to take her curlers out of her hair. One thing they made all us grandchildren do was write our names on the backs of any possessions they had that we wanted to have when they passed away. Sometimes we'd go over for a visit and come home with all sorts of stuff. Uh, like I was wearing her wool jacket. Um, on one such occasion, Oma convinced me to take their tent. You know, you know the tent that connected to the back of their minivan. I had little t kids at the time in a minivan, so I said, sure, I'll give it a try. When we took it out, it was a jumble of metal poles, and after quite some time of trying to sort through it, we gave up and put the whole thing in the scrap metal trailer. I felt awful because I had a lie for her for eight to years after, telling her how much fun we had camping in that tent. My aunt told me last weekend that they actually didn't like that tent because once they were sleeping in it and they woke up to a whole family of raccoons sleeping with them in their bed. <laughs> then came the time to, for Oma and Opa to get a computer. Every time I came over, there was something wrong with the computer. The mouse just goes up the screen, Jen. Um, and so I said, well, Oma, how are you steering your, how, how do you do it? And she was steering her mouse like this. So the mouse was only going up the screen. And then I would take the mouse and say, you have to move it from side to side like this. And she would say, oh, yeah, there it goes. <laughs> Opa called uh, the computer Oma's boyfriend. She would send us emails and lots of forwards. There was no punctuation, and often we were guessing at what she was trying to spell. Emails like this one from October 2013. <laughs> Hi, Jen. What a beautiful picture from the girls and baby. I love that. I sure will look out for a hot bus. That sounds good to me. To be too true, but we will see you at Opa and I are going to get some apple cider for you at Opa's. So would you like some too? And what kind would you like? The one with the addictives or the plain one, a big one or a small one? Thanks for writing me, Oma. <laughs> <laughs> I would send her photos of my littles and she would respond, Hi, Jen. What? The girls are soon will be walking. What a joy they will be. Then they might be everything into everything. So watch out for your shampoo. Thanks ever so much. Love, Oma and Opa. <laughs> she would write to ask if Krista had used her towels that she gave her at Christmas or telling me that the twins were on her screen shaver and she blew them a kiss every morning. This, la this is the last one I'll share. Um, so it was when I was pregnant, and it's all in capital letters. So it's, it's almost like, like she's yelling, right? Hi, Jen. How is your doctor's appointment? It is coming very close. The big day. We are thinking about you and praying to hear the good news soon. I just cannot get off the capital letters. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of steel chairs for Mark to pick up, but there's no hurry. The house is not sold yet, and also a wooden bread box, which you can refinish. All the best love and prayers go out your way, Oma. This was my Oma. She was thrifty to a fault, deeply committed to her family and community, and incredibly feisty right to the end. Uh, we loved her, even though sometimes she could be a little bit difficult. We cherish our memories with our grandparents, and we will certainly miss their presence in our lives. Today, we, re we rejoice that she's with Opa and that she's with Jesus, and we remember and celebrate her for who she was. <laughs> I wish I went before her. <laughs> I'd like to share a few words about what it was like growing up with mom. She was a unique person, but I didn't realize it until I was an adult. Mom encouraged, us to be, mom encouraged me to be an entrepreneur and hardworking, although I don't think it was intentional to teach us that. I can remember at the age of, of as early as four, I would go to work with my dad when he was building our house on Malton Drive. I'm sure that this was mom's idea for me to go a whole day with him. My, most of my summers growing up was spent doing things. Mom would go strawberry picking with us in Ancaster, 
The berries that she picked went to the freezer. Flo and I got paid per quart, picked. This was something I did not excel in. The berries were too good to put in the basket. Flo and I would bike down Highway 53 to Ancaster and pick for money. Flo would try to break 100 quarts. It was a good day if I did 20. <laughs> we were paid seven cents a quart. No, I didn't make much. Most summers, Harold and I spent time at relatives who had farms. The first week of the summer, we would go to the Klassen farm and where, where we would help with morning chores, milking the cows, etc. Then mom and dad, after a few weeks, would pick us up and bring us to the Vanderweer farm for a couple of weeks. And those are very interesting times. When I was part of the church cadet, when I was part of the church cadet club program, we were required to help with fundraising, which was selling chocolate bars, Mom said, suggested that I go stand outside the doors of the LCBO. I did very well. The next week, I took a case of boxes of chocolate bars, hopped on the bus to the LCBO, and sold the entire case in a day. At another time, Mom noticed in an ad in a magazine to sell all occasion cards. So, of course, she signed me up and ordered two cases. With a full wagon, away I went to every house in the neighborhood. I then crossed Highway 6 to the Aldercrest Survey and visited every house in there. They were a hard sell, so I went down Dickinson Road and 20, and 20 Road, Glancaster Roads, until I finally sold the last box. Again, Mom was amazed. Mom did PSW work for a while and had a young client on Airport Road just around the corner here in Mount Hope. She suggested that I read to him every Saturday afternoon. So I would bike down Highway 6 to Mount Hope and read him stories. I thought it was fun. There is such a thing as being frugal. Mom didn't waste anything. When she got word of a place that sold bread at, that passed the expiry date, her and dad filled up the freezer. It was a large freezer. Then dad got the idea to fiberglass the boat that he was building and causing the smell to go throughout the house <laughs> and into the bread. After a while, that bread didn't taste very good. Actually, it was awful. But we weren't going to throw it away. It took several months, and we ate it all. <laughs> Mom loved to volunteer at the thrift store and would often show us great deals that she got there. She loved to craft. Our Christmas tree was beautifully decorated with all the ornaments that she loved to craft with the girls. Holidays and occasions were important to Mom, and everyone was, and everyone was another reason to get together. Mom loved flowers and plants, as I already been mentioned. And I think it was a high point for her when I got into the greenhouse business. For several years, both mom and dad would help with picking. Mom had her shortcomings. She wasn't perfect. But I believe she did the best she could. In the years later, it was hard seeing mom's health going down, both physically and mentally. She went from Welling Wellingstone home to Heritage Green. And I need to give thanks to Alice. A big thank you for all the visiting that you did and for the care that you gave to mom. Alice would keep the family posted through WhatsApp so we could all be part of it. Through the years, we really saw the confidence that she had for my mom. Through the years, we really saw the confidence that she had in her faith. As her faith grew, we enjoyed different things that she would say, and she looked forward to heaven seeing Jesus. It was very real for her. A few days before she passed away, the nurse told us that mom told her that she wanted to go see Jesus. Flo, Alice, and I were with mom when she peacefully passed from this earth to her beloved Jesus. It was a bittersweet moment. Thanks for that, hey? And no, not too long. That's what we're here for. Yeah, so. Uh, good. Let's continue to, to sing this next song that we're going to sing. Uh, you'll see it in Dutch up on the screens. Uh, if you don't know what to make of all the Dutch words, uh, then in the bulletin, you can see the English words, and we can sing in English. 
Uh, it's worth standing up, hey, to, to, to sing. So if you're able, please rise and we'll sing together. It was good to give it a give it a go. It's good. You guys don't need to hang out here. You guys can have a. You know, God speaks into this uh, situation too, yeah. And so, in a moment, we'll hear God's word uh, from from the Psalms. Just before we do that, just before we do that, let's let's pray. Uh, Lord God, we pray that you would speak to us words of hope, that in these ancient words that we'll hear, we'd hear a present living word from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, Psalm 23. I'm happy to be following that song because it kind of brought a smile to my face, so it like got the tears away from the beautiful words that I've just kidding, they're back, <laughs> that everyone had to say it, but I think that Omar would have really thought that that was funny, half of us singing in English and half of us singing in Dutch. <laughs> All right, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Psalm chapter 23. Psalm chapter 23, and it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
<laughs> it's all good. Uh, so what a, what, a, what a great psalm. I'm glad some words were chosen that are f- familiar, right, to at least everyone's a little, a little familiar with this psalm. Whether you've been uh, brought up in the church or not, y- y- you have an idea of, of this psalm. And sometimes we might think it's overdone. We see it on plaques and plates and with pastoral scenes and, and little lambs. And, and sometimes uh, we hear it in movies and TVs. People kind of just repeat it kind of as if we say it often enough, it will give us some comfort. But it's not just a, it's not just a, a cute little poem, right? Th- these words meet us in, in dark places they, they, and in hard times. These are words of, of real comfort. You've lost a, a, a mom and an oma, right? And, and that's hard. Whatever the circumstances, that, that's hard. And so we start to feel that shadow of death, yeah? And this is where the psalm meets us, in the shadow of death. The first part of the psalm, it's kind of nice, right? Walking by pastures and waters and nice paths. And uh, perhaps those paths go by, if we have an image in our mind, perhaps we're strolling by flowers, which Joanna would have uh, loved, we've heard. And the psalmist says, I, I lack nothing. Might have had been thrifty, but we had enough, yeah? Uh, enough to share, enough to open our doors for others to have a place to stay. Enough. And perhaps we can think back to times where uh, we could say with the psalmist, I have, everything that I, I have everything that I need. Or perhaps we've had to learn that, learn that sort of contentment. You know, my life isn't how I've drawn it up, perhaps, or wished it could be, but I am content with my portion and with my path. I lack nothing. As we walk along those paths... But then, in the psalm, then the path starts descending, yeah? Uh, it gets hard, it gets rocky, it gets dark as it goes down, and the path gets more difficult and maybe lonely. And as the path gets hard, perhaps we get hard or feisty or blunt, as I've heard. But now we come to the bottom of this valley that the path has been descending into. Uh, The valley of the shadow of death. And and we feel it. And and as we feel that shadow, uh, we're confronted not only with all the, 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 whatever that brings up in us, fear or curiosity or grief, we're also uh, confronted with our own deaths as well, right? As we walk in this valley. And that's where we are now. And many of you have gone through this valley before. It's not strange, but it can still be difficult, right? The bottom of this valley, the psalmist can still say, I will not fear. And he says, I will not fear, because you are with me. I will not fear because you are with me. Things are never quite as scary when you have someone with you, right? In the dark valley, let me speak to you words of hope. You are not alone. There is someone with you. And then the picture in the psalm is beautiful, right? Uh, Amidst all the darkness and all the enemies surrounding, there's a table set. There's this relationship that we have. Uh, Even when we're surrounded with all the enemies, with sickness, with death, with worry, with anger, with all of this, God is with us and in relationship with us. Not alone. God will not abandon us, and he proved it. He came to be with us so intimately in Jesus. And Jesus walked that valley with us, right? And as He went even one step farther, right? He walked the whole valley with us, and then he went one farther, submitting himself to death too. He took on all of our humanity, all of our condition, all of our sin, all of our guilt. He was with us like that, and then he died with all of that. Here from Romans, you see, 
at just the right time when we were still powerless, when we were weak, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even us, who are often not the most lovable kind of people, right? We have nothing going for us. Nothing that would commend us to God anyways. And yet... He dies for us then. And that's the beginning of how we're coming up out of this valley. And that's the psalm takes us through that, right? With us in the valley, but then we need to be brought up out of the valley. And so who's going to do that? Well, the Lord is a shepherd. He's the one that knows the way out. And He knows how to refresh our souls. He made us. We are His. He knows what brings us joy. He knows what brings us refreshment. So here's someone who knows the way. We need someone who knows the way. And Jesus said, I am the way. And so we follow Jesus. He also said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So we follow Jesus because he is the way, but he's also the life that we get. Jesus rose from the dead, rose from that valley, right? And we come following after him up out of the valley of death and into this resurrection life. And we have hope for that same resurrection life that Jesus has. I am the resurrection and the life, he says. And, And he meant it. Whoever believes in him shares in his resurrection life, not to perish, but to share that life. And this is how we come up out of the valley. Yeah. And then, those encouraging words at the end, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right? There's something to look forward to that keep us going along that path. And we heard your mom and your oma say it, right? I'm going to heaven. She was looking forward to it. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus says, don't let all of this throw you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. There's plenty of room for you in my father's home. If that weren't so, would I have I told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so you can live where I live. I'm going to heaven. Joanne had this hope for heaven. We can have this hope for heaven because he has risen. Amen. As we reflect on that, uh, I know it's a lot of up and downs, but we'll stand again and we'll sing when peace like a river. And then we can just remain standing after that.
Let's pray. God, you sent your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to bring life into the world. And so we give you thanks that by his death, he destroyed the grip of death and that by his resurrection, he opened up the kingdom of God. We've just celebrated Easter, Lord. And so we pray that by your spirit, you would make us confident that because he lives, we shall also live. Amen. Uh, so from here, what we'll do is uh, I'll speak words of a blessing, a benediction uh, for you. We'll sing our last song till we meet again, and then uh, we'll lead the family out, and then if you could follow in behind the family, and you're uh, warmly invited to stay for a lunch, and that's out in the fellowship hall for us. So receive these words. May the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.